the definitive guide to retargeting on Facebook. Let's get down to the bottom of this because it is a super, uh, let's say, controversial topic. It's also something where the truth has evolved over the years. And I will tell you, I've absolutely had to change my position several times based on the information that we've seen from testing, from case studies, and from real world experience. So let's get down to the bottom of this. We are going to cover five super big topics about Facebook and retargeting, how it kind of maybe already does it, why less data in more places isn't necessarily a good thing, the impact that it might have on testing speed and expense, the impact on incremental lift, and most importantly, how you can use it to be really successful in ways that are not talked about nearly enough. So let's get down to the bottom of it. Facebook and retargeting the definitive guide right here, right now. Let's go. First thing, I just want to say thank you. You could be anywhere on the internet right now and you've chosen to be here. I want you to know that I take that as a privilege and a responsibility. I'm only going to talk to you about things that I personally have seen based on my own experience with over a nearly a decade in the business and over several hundred million dollars in spend across dozens of brands being seeing both massive success and being humbled with crippling failure and i want you to understand what i've learned from those places and often some of the greatest benefit is being in the room and helping very powerful people make very difficult decisions and with all of that being said, I just want to say thank you very much. And if you find value here, I really appreciate it. Go ahead and subscribe. If you want to know more things, you can sign up for my next webinar at apply.facebookdisruptor.com. And if you want to get into the Facebook Ads MBA program, you can go to submit.facebookdisruptor.com, grab yourself an application, and let's chat and see if that's the best fit for you. All right. All that being said, let's dive into it. The definitive guide to retargeting on Facebook. Well, at least as of March 2022. All right, so here we go. Fact number one. Facebook already does retargeting for us. Now, this has been a somewhat debated topic. I'm gonna get down to the empirical data that isn't necessarily debatable. And then we can, you know, open up some other bits of conversation. But I want to get down to a couple of things we know for a fact. Number one, even when you're trying to do retargeting through any means, often what we're trying to do is retarget people that have viewed videos or people that have clicked to a certain page or have taken a certain action. Now, whether or not somebody's taken those actions or just previously seen impressions from us, what ultimately Facebook is trying to do is deliver the highest quality user experience to the person receiving that ad, ultimately placing content in user's feed in a way that is going to make them have a positive experience on the platform. Now, oftentimes, a user might see content from a brand or whitelisted partners five times, a dozen times before they ever click. Now, if you're only retargeting folks that have added to cart or something like that, that's great. But understand that users already being retargeted maybe a dozen times because of how they've responded to that content previously. If somebody has seen something from you or stopped to read part of your, your text, or maybe they've gone through some other page that you've been on, um, whether that page is on Facebook or on your site, Facebook is seeing, well, this person has a level of intent and interest with your brand or with your content or with partners that you're using to uh, advertise with, like whitelisting an influencer. But the point here is Facebook is going to try to deliver that impression to really match two business objectives. Number one, give the best end user experience to the Facebook user on the app or on the website, because that's ultimately their business model is positive experiences for users. And ultimately, our job is to make sure that that also delivers a positive business objective. And Facebook is trying to deliver the action that you're optimizing for, which hopefully, if you're trying to make money, is a conversion objective running to a conversion event, like a purchase 
or a subscription, something along those lines, an app install or whatever it might be for you. So ultimately, Facebook is weighing in the end user experience on how they're going to see a positive in, in, uh Facebook environment to make them want to stay on the platform and come back, but also how to make sure that the person spending money with ads is ultimately getting an efficient and projectable outcome. That's how the system works. Now, when we're talking about Facebook already does remarketing for us, what we're saying is not only is somebody, re not only is Facebook retargeting the user that might have watched the video before, because they're probably, if they watched one video or three of them, they're probably going to positively respond to the next one. But they're also going to show ads to the people that have engaged positively with comments and likes and shares and all of that stuff on Instagram as well on, as on Facebook, or they've talked about you on WhatsApp or whatnot. They're also going to say, well, this person added a cart five minutes ago or yesterday. And honestly, if I'm trying to sell something and Facebook is trying to deliver me a conversion, Facebook, out of all of the available impressions, is going to ultimately try to deliver the best user experience while also delivering my business objectives. And it's a bit, one of the things that Facebook is trying to do, and a very arguable point here is, who's a better impression than, or let me put it this way, is somebody that added to cart five minutes ago or yesterday better than an absolute stranger? The honest truth is yes. And we know that Facebook ultimately does retargeting because our frequency how many times somebody sees an ad is never just one. So when it's 1.1, that means that the average person is getting retargeted already. We already know that that's happening. And so we know that Facebook is doing retargeting as it as is to ultimately deliver the ads in the right order to get somebody to have a positive experience. And our job is to make sure that those ads, when whatever order Facebook wants to deliver on whatever platforms those ads are delivered on, ultimately delivers a positive business experience, which is what Facebook's objective is based on the campaign type. And then our objective is to make that business outcome occur as efficiently as possible. And one of the best ways of doing that is ultimately trying to give Facebook the best types of content to get somebody to be engaged positively and want to take the desired business action. Ultimately, what we're talking about here is Facebook is doing retargeting for us. Now, one of the things that we've learned from the advanced matching side of the Power Five and that I've been you know, lucky enough to be a part of testing at scale is that this retargeting isn't just for your own brand. Facebook is retargeting people because they're interested in something. Now, if you've ever noticed, you've gone to say Daily Harvest or Me Undies or Last Crumb or whatever brand it is, maybe some drop shipping product during the holiday season. What happens to your feed? Well, for really good advertisers and for really good brands, what you see is a lot of accompanying brands and products that are exact, that are very similar, right? Like if you're looking at red shoes on Nike, well, you might see my ad from New Balance uh, the next time you log in. Because Facebook is understanding that you're in market for this. And really what's happening with advanced matching is Facebook's retargeting users that didn't necessarily just take an action on your site, but based on their intent and action on any number of sites based on that user's experience and overall uh, pattern of behavior over what might be a decade on the platform. And now this is where when Facebook does retargeting, they're retargeting users, not just because of what they've done with your brand, but anywhere. And Facebook is using that user's behavior trends across many, many years and countless web pages and Facebook groups and messages in Messenger and WhatsApp and every little other piece of data that Facebook has, zero party date, if you want to call it that, first party date, whatever, that at no point an iOS 14 issue could ever block. Or when Google releases the same type of update for Android, that will also not be able to block. And so the more and more we let Facebook control this journey with giving it a few really good ads and letting it then control that user journey because it has literally years and potentially thousands or millions of web pages and messages and oh, Facebook pages and groups and engagements to track from. They're very, very good at understanding what type of content somebody wants to see. And based on all of that, nearly every impression that your ad will 
ever make is at some point a retargeting impression, even if it's the first time they've ever seen your brand, because that person has shown an intent or a level of interest in the topic of conversation or the type of product or the brand or whatever it else is that identifies your ad account as having a positive a potential for a positive experience for that end user. If Facebook didn't think that that end user would see your content positively, Facebook wouldn't show it to that user because the ads do the targeting. So every ad impression, unless you have a brand new product that nobody's ever heard of before, you go straight to broad and you spend all of your budget in one millisecond, literally every impression is effectively a retargeting one anyway. So that being said, let's get into what happens when you start to use retargeting campaigns and retargeting ad sets. Ultimately, what this means is you now have to split your budget up, right? Some budget goes to retargeting and some budget goes to prospecting and some might go to testing and some might go to hopefully not, but some might go to another offer or three or four other products. And basically what happens is here, the more places you have to spend money, the lower amount of data any one of those places gets. And the most important thing to remember here is data is power. Knowledge is power. Every penny you spend is training the machine to understand what it is that you are trying to do. So we have to think of it with every dollar that we invest, every you know British pound sterling, every whatever your currency happens to be, every inch of that investment is ultimately teaching the machine a lesson, good or bad, on what it is that you as an advertiser want that machine to do. So why this is really important is, if you have say three or four retargeting audiences and a prospecting audience, what that means is, say half of your budget is going to retargeting and half is going to prospecting. Well, that prospecting campaign is now at best half as smart as it could be because it's seeing half of the data because you're spreading that data into many places. Ultimately, also, those retargeting audiences are inherently dumber than that prospecting one because they're also seeing only a portion of the budget. Now, that's obviously an oversimplification of the distribution of, uh, of dollars, but hopefully I, I hope you understand where this is going. Now, the reason that this is really important is because when you start to use retargeting audiences, one of the best practices at this point is to exclude those retargeting audiences from your prospecting, right? That is what standard PPC um, and email, so inventory and demand-based platform strategy is. Now, mind you, I didn't say that's what standard Facebook strategy is because Facebook is an optimized CPM environment. PPC strategy is not the same as an OCPM strategy. When you don't have a control over the end user experience, then you handle your strategy in a very different way than one that penalizes you for disrespecting the customer and gives you preferential treatment for treating them with care and concern for their overall user experience. My point to all of this is, when you begin to exclude retargeting audiences from your prospecting, what you're saying is your prospecting has to get the conversion basically on the first click or whatever you're retargeting. So let's say I'm doing prospecting and then I've got a view content 30 day and an add to cart seven. If I add to cart, now that means that my prospecting can't see that user again. So it'll never understand if that's a good or a bad impression. Also, once that user goes out of the add to cart seven day, they'll effectively go into the view content 30. So if that add to cart can't close the deal in seven days, then that user is not providing any more positive signals to that ad set. And then the view content picks up on day eight after somebody clicked but ignored the add to cart. So then they're getting day eight to day 30. Now, the real problem here is it means every one of those steps is inherently dumber then if you let just one ad set see everything, because if that one ad set can see the very first impression and the thing that got somebody to take that final click, 
over, say, a dozen impressions, maybe over a course of weeks because of a life cycle and decision making that may occur and ultimately what gets them over the edge, then that ad set can understand that journey for that user, plus every single other journey for every single other user. And what's really important here is what happens when you do that to dozens or hundreds or thousands of users. And especially if you do that with a handful of ads, ultimately those ads become extremely intelligent in how to deliver the proper user journey. So one of the big liabilities of having a highly segmented retargeting structure is that ultimately every single one of those investments is inherently dumber, which means you have to work much harder to make any of them work. And you are tremendously limiting the ability of the force multiplying power of machine learning, because if the prospecting campaign doesn't get the sale on the first click, then it failed. So that prospecting campaign has to get people ready to buy right now. Because say they click and then it takes them three or four days. Well, they're seeing ads from another ad set probably during that time. And especially if you have a view through attribution, say you're doing, even if you're not doing one day click, maybe doing a seven day click, one day view, then if somebody clicks within 24 hours of being shown some ad, they make a purchase, then it's the add to cart ad that gets credit for that sale. Even though somebody might have just incidentally seen something, it may or may not have any impact on their decision making to make the purchase. So now the data of what to reward is tremendously messy. And you're doing that across hundreds or thousands of users that are making the purchasing decisions over a course of a day or a week or a year. And if you're really just trying to take a look at this and you, you know, pull out a string and a set of pens and you try to make sense of it all, you're going to look like a crazy person because ultimately no two users behave the exact same way. And trying to ultimately test to improve any one of these things becomes insanely difficult and expensive. Let me get to that point. When you are trying to test to improve your prospecting, for instance, you can't test nearly as fast when you have five ad sets with some prospecting, some mid funnel, some bottom funnel. Because remember, if that user doesn't buy on the first click right away, then that user is effectively useless as a data point. So you're only letting a small percentage of the average user, which is you know probably not the lion's share of the average scalable impressions that are occurring as customers coming into your store, especially when you're talking about incremental lift, which we'll get to in a minute because people might very well just see 12 ads and then Google you, in which case none of those ads are getting the ability to understand what's happening, especially if somebody clicks on one ad and then gets shown something else and they're searching around like, that user will bounce through all sorts of experiences. And as you're trying to test to improve any one of them, you don't have control over where they are in that experience. And because every one of those data sets is changing on a very consistent basis, the person that's, a, uh, that's eligible for prospecting and the person that's eligible for mid funnel and the person that's eligible for bottom funnel, those audiences are extremely dynamic. So they're changing all the time. And one of the things that we have to know about the scientific method is it requires a constant to test a variable against. So if your constant is an audience and you're testing ads or offers or upsells or whatever, but this constant is changing every single day, what is the confidence on the outcome of this test? And more importantly, how much more expensive is it to test four or five different parts of the funnel, two parts of the funnel might double your testing budget and cut the time or make the time that costs that it takes to improve any of those outcomes in a meaningful way. It might double or triple the amount of time it takes for you to get a sustainable, constant outcome. So you have a much lower confidence test that is more expensive that takes longer to do based on less data to ultimately keep the system dumber while you have to work harder. And that really gets us down to the last piece about incremental lift. Do you want to make Facebook look as good as possible? 
Well, if you do, it's easy. Just jack up as much stuff and retargeting as possible, and you might get the lowest CPAs and the greatest row as you can. But ultimately, the more money you are spending on users who are likely to take an action anyway, the more money you are wasting, the less incremental lift you are getting in your business, the less additional sales occur because of additional dollars spent. And where this really comes into play is around the conversation of is Facebook really where you're getting the vast majority is of your sales? Is that where you're getting the majority of your revenue? Is that where you're getting, is that the most cost-effective way of monetizing attention? And one of the things that we know is Facebook ads are relatively expensive. The exchange rate on a Facebook ad is far worse than a search ad or an email. Right? An email might cost you a penny to send. And if you get a sale for 100 bucks, that's like a 10,000% you know, ROI. Now, clearly, that's not a scalable solution. I'm not saying that you should just run all email, although email is very powerful. The point is, at what point is it more cost effective to try to get as many people as possible into a customer journey and then let them co convert some of them by paid media on Facebook and some of them by other strategies that may or may not convert them at a much greater exchange rate. Because really, when you want to scale a brand, it's about creating as many customer journeys as possible that ultimately give you the, the, the most amount of opportunity to generate an LTV on a net new person. And where this really comes down to it is, the more you lean into retargeting on Facebook, the less you're leaning into overall revenue lift from your paid media efforts across your entire business. Because the more you're trying to lean into getting somebody to close the deal on retargeting, the more overlap you're getting of a sale that might be attributed to search and to email and to Facebook. And while your Facebook number is gonna look great, the overall growth of your business will be inhibited because those customers that are converting because of that retargeting ad may have already converted someplace else, but because you are just directly investing and in trying to get that person across the finish line no matter what, and you're willing to spend money on probably the worst exchange rate option available, you are investing your money in places where you're not getting the best return. And that fundamentally inhibits your incremental growth. And remember, you're doing that while also testing slower at a more expensive cost, keeping things dumber by trying to support more places, trying to get luckier, basically, and forcing yourself to work harder and also support far more resources. So ultimately, in this way, retargeting on Facebook is a luxury problem that very, very few advertisers have the need or ability to truly support. Now, all of that being said, where is retargeting a really good idea? Because I use retargeting. Uh, and I'm managing accounts that might spend a couple hundred a day, and I'm managing accounts where we're spending over 20000 a day. And I've, you know, most recently scaled uh, my, my clothing brand from 5,000 a day to over 20,000 a day in, in, in a couple of months. When am I using retargeting? Let me tell you the two best use cases for retargeting that I'm currently using. And I've been using these for years now. And every time I try to find other solutions, because believe me, I invest money in doing things poorly so that I can reinforce the idea of what good ideas are and what bad ideas are. And I continually gut check those things with dollars spent. And what continually shows to have value is two ideas. Number one, dynamic product ads, catalog sales ads. If you have the self-control and the ability and overall you've structured your business to drive sale of one flagship product and you've got maybe 20 SKUs, first off, that's excellent and congratulations. That's how you're gonna get to 20,000, 30,000, $50,000 a day. And if you're supporting five or 10 different products, you're rarely ever gonna get to half that because that's just, you are, Again, not only how have you made Facebook really struggle with data integrity and volume because of how many parts of the funnel you're segmenting, but when you then magnify that by four or five different products, it, you, you force multiply that problem 
by a factor of two, three, four, or five. If you're trying to support hundreds of objectives, there's no way you're going to do any of them well. And ultimately, the way you scale the brand is by maximizing the volume of a customer journey of CPA plus clogs divided by LTV. And so the point here is, well, maybe that customer is not interested in your primary offer. DPA, dynamic product ad catalog ads, are a great way of getting them across the finish line. Now, I've been using catalog ads for years. I was part of the alpha for the product um, many, many years ago. And there's a great opportunity here to show people the type of content, they, the type of products that they want to see. And it's basically just like a magazine that gets sent to you. You can flip through all the pages and you can see all of the things. We're all very used to this ad product. And it's a great way of saying, maybe this user isn't interested in my primary offer, but there's something else that I can give them that's a better fit, right? Maybe I'm just trying to sell everybody on the new Jordans, but they just want, a, they want you know, a tracksuit. Awesome. I got their attention because of one thing, but they were on my store. They went to a couple of the product pages. They may or may not have added a couple other things to cart. Let me show them the products that they wanted to see. My customer is telling me what they want, and it's not what I'm trying to sell. This is a product to allow you to clean that up in a way that does not impair the ability for your primary objective of your full funnel, broad ad set with no retargeting in it to do its job well, because this is incremental sales volume because you're selling products that that person probably wouldn't buy otherwise because it's not the main product that you're supporting with the primary ad dollars that you're spending. The other great use of retargeting is what we call a rebuff sell, a rebuttal upsell. Now I'm currently doing this in several places. I've been doing this for years, and this is a strategy I put together with an old boss of mine, her name is Marina, and she was an uh, infomercial boss. She worked at Guthrie Ranker. She would spend $100 million a year on infomercials. And what we realized is the Facebook ad is basically the first eight minutes of an infomercial. Here's the product. Here's a bunch of reasons why you should buy it, blah, 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 blah. Here's the product. What a Facebook ad doesn't do, especially when you're trying to drive a flagship product, is the but wait, there's more. Minute 9 to 22 of an infomercial. And yes, they're literally mapped down to the minute. You can clock infomercials and see the messaging of very successful ones versus bad ones. <laughs> and they're all basically the same, which is crazy, blew my mind. And then she showed me. And ever since then, the world just opened up. Like, I can see the matrix. It's, it's wild. The point here is, if somebody doesn't want to buy your flagship product, it doesn't mean that it's not a good fit for them. What it means is that offer isn't right. Now, the biggest mistake people make is they offer discounts. Never offer a discount. That's terrible business. Discounts are offered in retail because stores have to clear their shelves to bring in new inventory. And they, if they don't sell the product, they can always just send it back. So retail, real world store shelf strategy to clear inventory is a very different model than the way we need to be looking at e-commerce and direct consumer advertising because our needs are very different. But a rebuttal upsell says, if you don't want my one product, what about buy two, get one free? I can sell you three products, jacking up your AOV. Maybe buy three, get one free. I now can get triple the AOV of that user. So instead of them giving me $40, I get $120, which is great, especially if my standard AOV is, say, $100. Bucks. Now I can improve my A I can make an offer that gets me one user and one transaction to give me an AOV greater than the average customer would. And because I don't have to make that sale three times, I can afford to give away that fourth product because the cost of that fourth product, the cogs on that fourth product and the additional shipping cost, if any, is less than the acquisition cost of trying to sell that product two or three times. So I'm improving the LTV and I'm doing so at lower cost. The margin that CPA plus cogs divided by LTV math gets even better for me. So a rebuff sell is a fantastic way of improving and scaling your business because ultimately when you get that right it allows you to lose money on your primary offer it allows you to get, run your primary offer at an even higher volume at an even worse cpa because if your average ltv goes from 100 to 110 
That means your CPA on your primary offer gets to go from, say, 50 bucks to 55. And the more money you can spend to acquire a customer, inherently, that means the more money you can spend on acquiring customers because you don't have to run nearly as efficient, which means ultimately you get more and more people into your system, which means ultimately you get to test meaningfully after the click faster and faster and with higher confidence. And that's ultimately how you scale a brand. That is how you scale a brand. That is how you leverage a good business model to scaling overall revenue and profit volume. That is top line, that is bottom line. That is growth fundamentals. So ultimately, retargeting is a luxury item most advertisers do not have the budget or the need to try. But if you are, then really focus on DPA and rebuttal upsells because they solve a business problem that your primary offer ads don't solve. Finding a fit earn offer that that customer doesn't see with your primary ads and doing so in a way that acquires them at a more desirable ratio of CPA because DPAs are almost always really cheap. To make a sale and rebuttal upsells if you're getting three times the purchase value you can spend twice as much to acquire that customer and you're going to make even more money so anyway that's the bottom line that is the definitive guide to retargeting right now and i just i i, I just want you to take this in and please if you have any questions comment below if, if you need any help with this stuff let me know youtube thinks you might like some of these videos don't forget to subscribe and until next time i'll see you on the internet